eventually. And like I said, if I if it still gets weird, I I will do my best to um I'll just put it in there again. But I've I've sent it now a couple of times, and I'm pretty sure I got it right the last time. So okay, <clears throat> so um really quickly, we'll just uh this isn't a big group. I think I got eleven, which is a nice which is a nice um, size to quickly introduce everybody. Like I said, I'm new to uh, MOBT and, and everything else. So, um, you know, don't really know anybody and, and all that kind of stuff, but um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Shane Fudge and I am a assistant professor of sport management out of Indiana Tech in uh, Fort Wayne, <clears throat> um, Indiana. So in the same um, location as, as the PFW host, if we were physically hosting it. I am coming to you live from my porch uh, outside on what is already a hot day. And why I'm doing it here will become apparent in a little bit. <clears throat> um, uh, so I am in responsible for the sport management program as well as uh, general business curriculum um, out of our uh, school of business uh, at Indiana Tech. Um, and I will now would love to just hear from everybody uh, who you are and uh, where where you are right now and uh, your area of responsibility. We'll just go through everyone and um, and then we shall begin. Um, how about Kathleen? Hi, I'm Kathy Novak and I'm um, an assistant teaching professor at the University of Denver in the management department and I've got with me a service puppy that we're raising who is suddenly very demanding, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm uh, in Sydney, where it's midnight or seven minutes past. Uh, I've attended a few MOBTS meetings. I'm particularly interested in classroom misorganisation and I've been using um, chaos theories uh, and concepts for quite a while to inform all my teaching. And I teach casually here in Australia and also in Finland. Okay, great. I did my PhD at uh, UC in Canberra. So, oh, okay. And, and used to know several people in and out of UTS in that area. So yeah, um, yeah, real. Okay. Love that area. Uh, Jim. Uh, I'm, I am unmuted for a change. I'm Jim Stoner. I'm at Fordham University. I teach in the management area, although basically everything I teach is about climate change and global unsustainability. Great, uh, Terry. Hi, I'm also in Indiana in Terre Haute, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. I teach various management courses from innovation management, project management to leadership. This is my first time at this conference. Okay, uh, Carl. Carl Oliver, Loyola Marymount University, Los Angeles, and I've been teaching mostly business ethics. Okay, great. Lori? Hi, I'm Lori Peterson. I'm at Northeastern State University in Oklahoma. I teach mostly strategy and courses in the healthcare program. If I have to step away, I just moved into a new house and supposedly the internet guy is on his way. <laughs> This is not, not the needed. first time I've been told that. So, gotcha. okay. Uh, <laughs> nice to see everybody this morning. Okay, uh, Denise. Uh, good morning. I'm Denise Williams from Metropolitan State University in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, and I teach entrepreneurship, organizational behavior, and diversity. Happy to be. Here. Great, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa DeLise, and I am at Meredith College, which is a women's college in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I teach principles of management, OB, and a variety of our HR courses. Okay, great. And Joe, I think you were the last to come in. Yeah, my name is Joe Girard. I teach at Western New England University, mostly strategy, um, so, uh, sometimes ethics, and project management, and um, we're in Western Massachusetts. Okay, great. Uh, so let me just ask, and uh, people can do this via the uh, chat. Uh, why, why this session? Why, why this session? Uh, there, there are some other excellent. I'm not trying to sell other people's cars for them, but there's some, 
there's some other uh, great sounding stuff happening at this time. So uh, if everyone just wants to type in, want to use one word or phrase, uh, please go ahead. Why, why the session? What the, what's the interest or even just curiosity? Feel free to say it, uh, type it. Great. <laughs> internet guy, go internet guy. Okay, good. Ah, cool, complexity. Okay. <laughs> we are in a type of, we are in a type of chaos with the pandemic. <laughs> you can, yeah, strategy. Sure, thank you, good, okay. So, uh, great, so several people, several people have got some grounding in this and I had no idea if I needed to explain some of the background stuff. A couple of you uh, probably do want some of the background stuff, so I won't skip over that. Um, I'll get into that. So, yeah, this one, yeah, this one's supposed to be recorded, yes. Um, so basically what I get into, um, I am not going to talk about my actual research in this. This presentation is not my research. Um, I, I will gladly talk about my research and how this, uh, set of theories and, and all that knowledge gathering and how I like to approach this sort of grounded framework. Um, I'll gladly talk about that with people afterwards if, if they want. Um, but this, this is a presentation where I'm just trying to utilize a theoretical framework that I've been interested in since I started my doctoral work back in um, 2010 um, that I apply to organizations that are stuck in systems that don't work. And the reason they don't work is they're dealing with a chaotic state that they don't understand. And then I attempt to um, figure out how to help them solve those problems. And, and I'll talk to people about that afterwards if they want. But this presentation is about utilizing the concept of a chaotic system or a nonlinear system that is very dynamical in the classroom and how we can alter our perspective. So I'm, I'm not going to give you a definitive, here, here's, a, here's a tool or not a tool, but here's a, uh, a method that, that everyone can try because that's the beauty of a chaotic situation. It doesn't matter what I say works for me, it's probably not going to work for you. You have to figure it out yourself. But by expanding our perspectives on some of these issues, I've found it helps a lot of people simply deal with their situations better. So all of us have a common situation, which would be um, the classroom. So I just like to overlay the idea of, of what is chaos um, to certain situations and contexts. So for the sake of this conference and its focus, I was pushing that towards the classroom. Uh, and hopefully it allows everyone to figure out, number one, the tools you actually already have that you didn't know you had. Uh, and then number two, how to develop new tools for dealing with situations that seem to be, like someone just mentioned the pandemic, spiraling out of control. So we're gonna... Uh, <clears throat> study that stuff and take a look at it. Okay, so there we go. This is just the outline. If you have the file, you've already looked at it. This is just, this is the overview. Um, again, I started this and built it so that we would be in the actual classroom together before we went virtual. So some of this stuff, it isn't gonna happen. Some of it will happen. It'll just happen a little bit differently, but I don't need to waste time going over that. Everybody can read that. You know, we just wanna, it's, it's about, I'll just point out the objective. Um, just trying to enhance an understanding, enhance the, the encouraging a work with it rather than be afraid of it um, mentality. Um, and I think all of you that have already said you've dealt with this concept and worked with it, I think you already are familiar with that and kind of get where I'm going at with that, you know, um, work with it rather than be afraid of it. I think that's why a lot of groups uh, suffer um, more than they should. Um, at any point in time, please ask questions, ask for clarification, ask for anything at all. That's totally fine. Um, if everything goes the way I want it to, there will also, I'll warn you right now, there will be a point in time where you're going to have to adjust your volume personally. So I don't <laughs> like blow out your eardrums. Um, I've done a few tests on a few things. It can get a little crazy if that happens. I'm just, this is, these are all, I need like informed consent. I need like an IRB for my thing. So 
let's just let's just start in the beginning and then we'll try and do again the, the point of this originally was we were going to be doing a lot of stuff together and hopefully we still can so we'll just start you know just look at the beginning stuff these are basic definitions things that a lot of people don't fully understand when it comes to this idea and this and this concept um so basically if you're in a state of of chaotic conditions or you're in a, a state of chaos really what you're talking about is a system that appears to be stable but it's actually incredibly unstable or being pushed towards a period of instability by really small minor all on their own you know one at a time they're insignificant factors and when you take them one at a time they don't seem like much but that small nudge in the beginning of the time <clears throat> or the life cycle of that system by the as you extend that time it actually really affects it significantly so you know you get that little bit that moves you to the left or the right so you know a few inches you don't think that's a big deal you expand that distance at a mile very, very different you're, you're nowhere near where you started so some of the people who really started with this, this was made famous a long time ago, early 1900s. Poincaré, who was a famous mathematician, he looked at a, an example, and he was one of the first ever people to do this behaviorally, really. Uh, his example of man walks outside and is killed by blank. Um, so that's simply referring to, I could go out, I could be as careful as I want. I could walk, step off my porch right now, and an airplane could land on my head. That's that's chaos. That's life. That's the universe saying we don't care how careful you are. That freaks a lot of people out and it makes people naturally be afraid of conditions and situations that you don't have that level of control over. So for most people, psychologically, when they lack that control, they are starting to enter this state of being in chaos and it frightens them. I'm sure everyone here can think of students they've had undergrad and graduate level who struggled in the classroom from start to finish, middle and end, simply because they didn't have what they perceived to be control over the environment. Is that an accurate guess on my part? People can, yep. Okay. And again, feel free to um, chime in in the chat on stuff like that. So some of these other situations that we're looking at, again, chaos still relates to a pattern of behavior you're still defined by the parameters of your system, even though it's in a state of total disorganization. So what we actually end up with are examples in this field that are predetermined chaos. So we can apply this to a pattern of behavior um, that's still, there's still a, de a determined set of rules, right? For the system, which is our classroom. So what would be, and again, say out loud or, or type if you want to, what would be the predetermined rules for how a classroom is seen as an environment? What are, what are predetermined aspects, concepts, constructs of a classroom, any classroom you've ever had? Any ideas? Well, there are students and a professor right predetermined roles right predetermined uh, roles in many places the the environment is predetermined with chalkboards whiteboards tables chairs doors maybe windows if you're lucky joe is uh yeah Mind. saying similar things what else do students expect a student walks in doesn't matter what your class is doesn't matter the level they know that there's going to be it starts here and it ends here. I don't walk into my class in the fall and say, hey, just because I feel like it, this is a four week class. It's just do it in four weeks. I just think we can. I just think you guys got it in you. Let's just take 16 weeks of material. Let's just crank it out in four weeks and let's, let's, just, let's just quietly, let's just really not tell anyone we're not coming anymore. You guys take a little break. If you said that, your class would probably descend into chaos, wouldn't they? Kathleen, sorry, you had a question or a point? Well, you know, it's interesting. They come in with a whole set of expectations. You know, I come in, I sit down, I open my laptop, I turn off and just type randomly. Or the professor will tell me everything that I was supposed to read 
so I don't need to read. Um, I have no choice in this, so I'm just going to sit back. So when you upend any of that, it goes into chaos, just like you were talking about. Right. So some students, again, we hear it all the time, this generation, they're too soft, they're too fragile, you can't say no to them, uh, they need everything spelled out for them, they got to have their hand held, blah, 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 blah. You know, you can buy into that if you want, or you can accept it. You can look at that in a more scientific academic way, which is those, that's simply a group of people that really struggle with their predetermined notion of what that system of education at that level is going to be. And when you alter it a little too much, you are descending them into chaos and a system in chaos behaves unexpectedly, right? Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. So what Terry's talking about now is we're starting to talk about system tools, things yeah. that help you understand conditions around you. So that's awesome. You've already done that for me. I'm going to have you look at example one. Ah, coffee cup. Who's got a drink with them this morning? Anybody got a drink with them this morning? Like me? Fantastic. Is it warm? Even though it's like almost 90 degrees here now, I still this is warm. Everyone's got something pretty hot in their cup, right? Yeah? Okay. Strong. <laughs> I, I'm already really gross. I'm sorry. I was hanging hog pa panels um, out, on, out, out back since like seven this morning. So I'm already gross. Sorry. But you know, you do it outside. So this cup is already a state of chaos. And here's why. If you've, if you've already done this, great. If you've never thought about it before. This cup is a predetermined set of parameters. My liquid, what I want to drink goes in the cup. It can't go in and it can't go out. If it's out of the cup, it's not my drink anymore. It shouldn't be. It's in here, right? I'm not, but when it's in here, I can do only two things. I can only do one of two things. I can only tell you one of two things with this. Okay. And I'm sorry if the video is not good enough, but there's steam coming up out of this, right? And most of you probably have steam coming up out of this. All right. I can do one of two things. I can put a temperature gauge in here right now and tell you exactly what the temperature of this liquid is right now. And then the only, I can tell you that with certainty because I can measure it right now. What I cannot do is tell you exactly what the temperature is going to be at any point or time interval moving forwards with specificity and accuracy. I can't do that because I have no idea what conditions are affecting this. The only other thing I could tell you is in two hours time, this liquid will be room temperature. And that's it. The point between now when it's this temperature and when it finally settles on the other end of the spectrum, okay, that's the only things I can tell you with certainty. Everything in between, it's in total chaos. There's a, I'm outside. There's a breeze blowing across the top. There's bugs going by. What if something lands in it? What if I spill it? What if I put it over here in the sun? What if I put it over here in the shade? What if the cat comes and licks it, which she probably will in a minute? Sorry. I'm outdoors on a farm. It's going to happen. There's not, I can't tell you. I just, I just can't. No one can, not really. They can, I can make an estimation. I can do charts. I can look up previous research on, you know, well, average cooling temperatures of this, that, and the other thing on it. Yeah, that's fine. But I don't know exactly what's going to affect this outside with so many different variables. So this, this liquid is constantly, as it pulls the cool air down and everything, swirls around, comes up, releases the energy, right? Thermodynamics, which is a big part of chaos. I don't know. I can't tell you. I can tell you what it is right now. I can't tell you. I can tell you what it's going to be in a couple hours. In between, I don't know. I have no idea. So it's dynamical in that cup. It's dynamical in nature. Okay. I really don't know what's going to happen. And that's kind of the fun part. Now, again, we live with a cohort of students, some of us anyway, that really don't do well with that. They just don't. We can ridicule them and speak negatively about them all we want, but it doesn't solve the problem of they need to be assisted in understanding the dynamic nature of education. This is just 
I'm not going to read this to you. I don't, I don't need to. You've got the file. You should have already seen it. The only thing I'm going to read is from Edward Lorenz, who was the modern famous person for studying chaos theory. Edward Lorenz, anyone know, anyone know who Edward Lorenz is? There's probably a couple of people in here. Who am I talking about? Who know who? Elizabeth, enlighten us, so I'm not just talking all the time. He was actually a meteor or studying meteorology, so studying weather patterns, hence a lot of the metaphors in the early days are weather related yeah yep so Edward lorenz was was a fame a, a weather a meteorologist he set up on a ancient computer back in the 60s a weather prediction pattern and at the time you were supposed to like watch it he got bored he literally got up went for went for a cup of coffee came back much longer later than he thought he would and the pattern was insane and he thought how did this happen and that's when he realized small changes in the beginning of the weather pattern created totally unknown, unpredictable patterns. Well, he made the initial and, first small change. Right. Yes, he made that. Well, I'm just going to like, what if I do this? And he had no, he was like, wow, I can't believe that created that. So he came up with this concept. So again, chaos is when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. Yeah. Now, here's the really fun bit about studying this and not being scared about it. There's actually a massive, massive amount and opportunity to learn, have feedback loops, double loop learning, which is a big deal of part of my research is possible because there's so much failure and there's so much unexpected outcomes when you look at this stuff. Small differences in initial conditions yield widely diverging outcomes and encourage simply encouraging a classroom where there is there is a anticipation and acceptance of that could be extremely valuable now how do you want to do that well that's a that's a golden question right and and that should be what we collectively try and discuss <clears throat> so here is lorenz's this is the butterfly effect this is what this was what his weather pattern looked like. This is is this the original one? I, I don't know. It's just you know, this is more or less what it looks like. You, it, they're not perfect. They're different, right? There's di every single one of those thousands of cycles that create this diagram are slightly different and very difficult to determine in a linear sense, right? All of this stuff is working in a certain in a certain way to be as unpredictable as possible. Okay, I'm going to get everyone to do something now. Example two, one step to the right. Does everyone have something to write on? Some paper. Please take a second to get some. I'm going to get mine. Oh, great. So what we're going to do is easy, okay? In the beginning, simply take your paper anywhere on it. It doesn't matter where. Just start on the left or the right. I don't care, okay? Uh, simply draw. I'm going to do an X. You can do a person. You can do a circle, whatever, whatever you want, okay? So do that. And then all I want you to do is draw the next symbol the exact same thing just draw another one but put it one small step or shift to the right or the left depending on what side you saw i wrote down the right just because right and up so my next one goes here like that oh. you see that and then just keep going do 10 of them one, two, three, four, five, six. What have I got? Seven, eight, nine, ten. Have you already done that? Quickly? Or, again, I'm just doing X's. Some people get really into it. So you should have ten. You should have ten of something. Ten symbols that were drawn, simply shifting one to the other. Mine looks like that. Now, just circle the middle ones. Can you see that? 
Just circle the middle ones. And then draw two straight lines down to the beginning of your first one. Do that. Oh, down that way. Everybody done that? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it doesn't look exactly like mine. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this distance doesn't seem significant. If this were a system in flux and that was an organizational change or a change to your classroom curriculum or the dean comes in and say, hey, guess what? You have to make this kind of change to your syllabus. You wouldn't panic. The distance between those is really not that big a deal. But remember, we started here and here. So now circle and extend the lines for your first and last one. You're gonna look basically like that. And now I have a significantly different, much more, much more significant change from the initial inception, conception, however you want to put it, of your system to the end point over time. But yet each individual change was small. It was simply one step to the right in this example. And I only did 10. I only did, let's say, metaphorically, 10 weeks of a syllabus. And yet look where my students started and look where my students ended up, depending on how I'm engaging with them in the classroom. It's not hard to fall into one of these uh, systems or conditions at all. Small changes, right? Now, everyone still have their paper? Let's do something else. That piece of paper that I just had you very carefully do that uh, little exercise on, just, uh, just give it one of these, let's do that, ball it up. Just do that. When you're done, hold it up. Pick a target wherever you are in your room. Anything. It's got to be at least let's say six feet away from you. There's a bench over there. I'm going to, I'm going to aim for it. Okay. I'm not going to turn my camera. I want you to do your best to hit your target exactly as you want. Ready? One, two, three. Dang it. I missed. Anyone score perfectly? No. Why not? Close. Wasn't that far away. Was <laughs> Sorry, Elizabeth? Well, I hit the object, but not where I intended. And, and why I do you think you didn't? Piece of paper roll. <laughs> okay. So what kinds of things factored in there to affect your execution of that task? Oh, the weight of the paper, the distance, my capacity to throw, time of right. night. <laughs> It was predetermined that you were going to throw it and you were going to get close, but were you going to get exactly where you wanted to be? No. Why? Because that is a very simple chaotic situation with some dynamic features. She just listed them. Your students do not get their assignments done on time due to those chaotic dynamic interferences in their work. Some of them are self-inflicted. I'm not going to let them off the hook. Some of them are systemic. Can everyone see this? Yeah, great photo. What is, wow. what is that? Murmuration. It's birds. It is a flock of birds. What kind? I don't know. The ones that fly? I have no idea. Shark, I think. And they are moving in what appears to be pretty random pattern, but yet all together. Nature's fast. <clears throat> I will attempt to do a sport example later. Um, pitchers not following statistics or sabermetrics, for example, is an easy example for sport. 
Um, so I can do that in more detail later. So this, whoops, sorry. This is an example, once again, the, this is, this is uh, they, they were trying to figure out when they studied this stuff, how do they know where to go? Turns out there is no lead bird. They're all responding to the distance between each other. And when the distance between each other gets too big, they go one way to correct. And when the distance gets too close, they move apart to correct. And that's only if there's no predators around or they're not trying to deal with food. So there's a million different things making them move like this. Nature is phenomenal when it comes to these things. So what you're looking at here again are strange attractors and bifurcation. And these are really common chaos theory uh, elements. They, they exist, okay, um, all the time. So really, what are we what are we talking about? We're simply talking. Strange attractor is is and the math on this is is mind blowing. So I won't even bother to talk about it. I talk about it in a behavioral way. Strange attractor is that what is pulling you to behave the way you are, and what is making someone either make a good choice or a bad choice, if you want to uh, put it in that context. It's got enough of a pull and enough of a weight and enough of a gravity that it is making things move towards it, but it's strange. So the behavior that it's causing is very unknown. So why do some students act certain ways in classrooms? What is it about the classroom environment? What is the strange attractor in your classroom? When you get affected by a strange attractor in a system long enough, heavily enough, you get a bifurcation. And this is where you get a branching off of what you thought was going to happen and you end up on a totally new path. Okay, a, a totally new path. So I will move to, I do, I'm going to, this is, you can, you have the slides now, so you can, you can look at it um, yourself, but I'm going to go to this one and attempt to share this. This is the double pendulum example and it's an example of a system that while it can't move beyond its predetermined total realm of movement its movement within it is completely unpredictable pretty cool right everyone see that hopefully you can see my screen can everyone see that screen sorry yep, yep. okay I know it's an animation, so you're like, well, it's an animation. Okay, fine. <laughs> Here they are at uh, Northwestern. They've actually literally built one. Oh, sorry, this is the, they did this at the Harvard lab. They literally built one. Hang on, I wanna get to the point where they do both of them at the same time, because that's really cool. Come on, there we go. Just put this in your mind as two seemingly identical students in the same class who do not behave the same way at all. But why? What conditions are affecting them? What perturbations to their mentality, to their attitude, to their motivation? What is making them do the things they do? There's a lot of really fun stuff. That's why I gave you the slides. There's a bunch of examples on this. I'm going to Hop out of it though. Let me go back to this. So when you look at this stuff, this is what it is to be graphed. That's a strange attractor, right? It's just pulling you down. What kind of classroom examples could we say represent or are represented by this? mathematical graphing of something that attract that strange attractor pulling pulling people into a pattern of behavior that you just are bewildered when you see it we've, we've had like who's, oh i'm sorry we had a death of a student on campus 
totally change things. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe somebody who's who's extremely extroverted, you know, very magnetic personality, and can pull the classroom either positively or negatively. The way to beyond your control. <laughs> what's, what's that positive way of describing that irritating? They're 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 too into it. You know. Um, it's great when students are engaged, but you look at that kid and you're like, I, you're at like a 12 out of 10. I need you at like a five. It's Monday. <laughs> I'm tired too. Yeah. Right. And you don't want to kill that kid's enthusiasm, but that kid is a strange attractor. If left unchecked, they are the source of chaos. Everyone gets like, Oh, they're, you know, they see this kid getting ramped up and they're like, oh, yeah, there goes the professor's lecture, man. They're going to deal with this guy for he's going to say something. Right. And that that's just this. That's just the mathematical concept of that chaotic, strange attractor creating a, a bifurcation. This is a really simple diagram. That has some good behavioral uh, terminology. That's why I like it. It's not math-based. Um, you see all the different items there that just think of your syllabus, right? Your syllabus is, if I start here and we're going to go like this and I want to end up here at the end of the semester and I always want to end up here. And then I've never, I've never had a syllabus written that I, I finish where, I, you know what I mean? Like my start to finish goes the way I thought it would. I've never had that happen, ever, ever. So it's just really weird. I, I always have bifurcations, always. Something always happens. I always get either one, and sometimes it's positive, right? Transformation, wonderful. You reach a student. They don't go down this pathway of disintegration and wasted energy, which is, and you know, the concept of entropy, which we won't, I won't. I think Elizabeth wants to talk about entropy a lot. <laughs> and I do too, but not today, maybe later. Because uh, disentropy is whatever. I'm, I'm already getting distracted. See, I'm, all, I'm, I'm the worst. I'm bifurcation. I'm the worst. I'm like the worst one at it, you know? Um, transformation, sustainability, what are you going to get? Now, here's the cool thing. If you can figure out how to anticipate bifurcations in your classroom from this concept, when you make them work positively, you actually get self-organization. And we're all behavior people, and we all know what learning organizations are. We all know about self-organization and organic, right? That wonderful concept of self-organization dynamical self-organization and, and self-serving teams and all that kind of stuff. You can get that. <clears throat> you can get that. Black Lives Matter protests in this country right now are self-organization so perfectly formulated and being played out in a, in a real life from theory example based on a bifurcation point. They killed that guy. That was the edge of chaos. It tipped everybody over. The strange attractor blew apart the system. And, and literally, you know, the thing that I kept, because me doing things the way I do it, what I kept noticing in the news, there was no leader. There's no one leading the protests. There's no one person. There's no MLK anymore, right? There's, there's no, there's no, no one, even the, even the pseudo civil rights leaders that we still kind of have, they were nowhere to be seen. It was just people. It's just, it's just massive groups of people self-organizing. They bifurcated. Their normal day was get up, go to work, be pissed off at the system. Not no more. They've transformed themselves into this movement. Is it going to work? I don't know. I have no idea. I can't even tell you when that coffee is going to be the room temperature. What the hell do I know? I don't, I don't know. But that's what's happening. And you, you just don't know. These points, right? Balance and stability. Whoops. Isn't that terrifying? You know what? like, oh, let's go swim in the ocean. Australia. Jeez. I don't know how I survived that country. That's not even the worst thing you guys got. It's not even, 
Yeah, like, that's nothing. That's nothing like poisonous. God, I've never been more terrified to walk in tall grass in my life in that country. <laughs> it's crazy. But what a wonderful example, once again, of that system we were just looking at. School of fish, not a flock of birds. But boy, what a bifurcation of the system. Mm, good job. So, and again, that's just, that's the usual graph. We've already done give it your best shot. That was the paper. I'm moving along. Time. How do we really want to deal with stuff? There are some fantastic people. Those of you that are already into this subject, I know you've read Miller and Page. I know you've looked at uh, Middleton Kelly. If you have not and you are new to this, please go get those works. They are I'm down here and they're, you know what I mean? They're up here. I'm going to go out of, I'm going to go out of frame. That's where I am. <laughs> they're, and these guys are up here in applying this stuff to organizations, settings, situations, uh, mapping it out, telling you how to apply it. And they say the tool is a complex adaptive system. We live in a complex adaptive system. What it is is written out there. I'm not going to babble off to you. But we live in them. We are interconnected, interdependent, everything. And the tools you use to deal with these situations will dictate, even in just your classroom, we'll just keep it in the classroom space. The tools you use are going to be what determines your success. I'm going to move over here. Stay with me. Let's talk about tools. What is this? Anyone want to tell me? This is one of my favorite tools. I live on a farm. I have a lot of tools. I have to. This is one of my favorites. It's a pry bar. Okay. This is a pry bar, nail puller, demo bar. This is fantastic. This allows me to pull every sort of nail out of every sort of debris, busted up old barn, lumber, the house, anything. I can get under things and pry. I can get a different angle. I can get under things. It's incredibly strong. This is an extremely simple design. It's one piece of metal bent in two places. And I can do more with this than I can with a hammer. Many of us come at a complex situation with a hammer. And you know what I can do with a hammer? I can hammer things and that's it. I can do so much more with this. This is an adaptable tool. What tool do you have that is adaptable, right? What about this one? Anyone know what this is? Sorry. Thoughts? I should know. <laughs> Some combination of a socket wrench and a screwdriver. Right away, you're saying, well, it's a combination of something. It's got, it's got this and this. And it's, it's pretty simple looking, right? And that's its beauty. This is, this is the simplest looking thing you're ever going to get. Any other guesses? Sorry, if someone's talking in the chat, I've totally... <laughs> Missed it, my bad. No? So this is actually called, the actual term for this is a scrunch, which is so stupid. It's a scrunch, but I just call it what it really is. It's the, it's the best tool I've ever had. Okay? Because this is a chainsaw wrench. So this is extremely simple. So hang, hang with me. We're going to start moving. <laughs> I don't, if I lose you, I lose you. Oh, everybody still with me? Yeah, we're all here. All right, cool. This thing is fantastic. If you can't see me, hear me, just let me know. Just shout out, okay? Because this thing... Helps me use this thing. Everybody should know what this is. 
<laughs> Just don't cut yourself. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> not today, but other days. This is a chainsaw. This is my biggest chainsaw. This is a Echo CS90, 590, sorry, Timberwolf with a 20 inch bar and a full size half inch chisel. So basically this is an absolute beast. This thing will cut down basically anything. I can even put a 24 inch bar on this and cut down trees that you wouldn't be able to get four people reaching around them. This is a really easy example of a chaotic system. Why? Because there's a lot going on. It is not safe. It causes a lot of issues, a lot of fear, and a lot of noise. Case in point, this is where you might want to check your volume, people. Do do do. Not that. So that was fun for me, anyway. So I got to do all day. Everybody still hear me? Yep. Now, this certainly sounds like something a lot of people don't want to have anything to do with. But here's the fun thing. With this, I can completely take this apart. No problem at all. That's the beauty of it. This is a very chaotic system, right? I mean, that's what this is. Chainsaw is nothing but chaos, metal. Ugh and sharp teeth. Ugh. Stuff that, I mean, one, one false move, one distraction. And uh, I'm dead, I can cut my foot off. Cut my arm off, chain can bust, which is terrifying if you've ever had that happen to you before. You know? Boy, she's hot. Ah. Not so scary looking now, is it? I've literally taken his teeth off and I've done it all with this. I can tighten my chain. I can adjust my throttle. I can put on a different size bar. I can do everything I need in the field. When I'm clearing land, which I have to do a lot with the property that I have, I don't have time for really sensitive tools. I need to make initial changes and I need to do it quickly. And there's so much chaos when you're using that type of tool, but I can do literally everything I need to it out in the field with that one stupidly named scrunch. So all I'm asking from you guys today, again, I can, I can take everything apart. All I'm asking for you today now <coughs> is which one of these, what do you already have in your arsenal in a classroom? that due to its simplicity is actually extremely adaptable. 
and can deal with a system as loud and noisy and disgusting and dirty as that beast of a sow over there, which I now have to put back together. <laughs> Whatever, I'm not going to pretend I don't like doing that. <clears throat> so last five minutes, questions, comments, ideas on what tools do you already have that you overlook perhaps uh, because they appear simply too simple. Um, not that they, they don't appear to be as complex as the problem. So they don't work false. A simplistic tool is extremely adaptable in a complex situation. That's the beauty of complex adaptive systems in your classroom. Any thoughts, any ideas here in the last little bit? Or other examples that people want me to um, talk about. Ah, grease literally everywhere. I would say time. Utilization of time, even though it can determine a lot of the chaos, how you frame time. I mean, it could be on a tipping point, right? It could either be a very simple tool or a very complex tool, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Oftentimes that we're not fine, that we're not as deliberate or as strategic enough, or we get so locked into timing that, you know, just taking a step back. You could even, you know, in a classroom, you could just say, where are we right now? How does everybody feel? And then redistribute the time accordingly. It seems so simple, but oftentimes people overlook that. A classroom time where you purposely schedule nothing. Yeah. This is debrief time, guys. Yeah, Let's... debrief time. Reflection. Yeah. And reset. No problem, Mary Grace. Thank you for coming. Um, oh, sorry, Kathleen. I was going to look at the oh, question I... in the chat, but that's fine. No, I think even just that stop and asking the question, what's going on? Um, and that simple act of questioning and then being able to, like you said, let go of my predetermined um, schedule and misplaced sense of control. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, again, the more chaotic, loud, noisy, like, oh my God, I can't hear myself think type situation, it, urgency, time is short. I have to make a decision now. Perhaps, but not automatically. Mm -hmm. And our students sometimes panic that way when they're looking at a syllabus or not. They do the opposite. They don't look at it. And then they realize, oh, there's something due tomorrow. Right? Um, I do not know the SINFIN domains of knowledge. I might have seen that a while ago, but I cannot recall it now. The term is familiar, but I, right now, it's so please. Pronounced, it, it's pronounced Kinevin. Okay. And chaos is the fourth of the domains. Ah. So the other three are simple, complicated, complex, and chaos. And it's a way of thinking about how we use knowledge in different situations. So gotcha. today you've taken us into the complicated domain in that you've got a lot of knowledge. You've been giving us the expert view on it. Um, and, and the expert view has been around... Uh, issues of chaos. I guess I'd want to have a much longer conversation about, and you'll see I've got another question up there, whether the chainsaw is chaos at all times or only when it's in use. And that would be one of the things that the Kinevin domains would help you think. Well, yeah, would help very, you think that. Very philosophically, when it's turned off, it's not, right? I can go, yeah. well, and it's it's state of rest right now. Well, you know yeah. what? I've turned it off. It's super hot. If I brush up against it, I'm going to burn myself. That's still pretty chaotic. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, you can, you can look at it. That goes back. I always relate back to when I have the gun control conversation with people. You know, guns don't kill people. People with guns kill people. I'm sorry, but there's always design. I've never seen a gun that's designed to help me toss a salad. <laughs> or oh, plant thank flowers. You. Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I get it. The guns sit. The guns just sitting there. It's not going to kill you. Mm. <laughs> that's just, dude, just man. Let's just ex increase the time parameter. Eventually yeah. someone's going to pick it up and there's nothing else to do with it. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. 
but uh, yes, absolutely. I get, I appreciate the, the question. Any other, we're at 11. Um, we're, we're at 11 o'clock, um, but we can keep, I think we get 10, five or 10 more minutes. I can't remember. I'm sh uh, Brandon is just somewhere floating around. Um, he'll tell us. So any, any other questions or clarifications? I know somebody was asking about a different example at one point in time, but not sure. All oh, right, baseball. Baseball is this fantastically weird sport that's become dependent on statistics and sabermetrics and convoluted math to be able to understand the average likelihood of someone doing something and behaving a certain way. Uh, and basically anytime someone bucks their statistics, right? Well, here's this left-handed pitcher and he's been uh, deactivated for three days and he's up in the fifth and he normally does this, that, and the other thing. And here's a, here's 50 to a hundred different stats on how he performs in this particular situation as predetermined as possible. Right. And then he just whiffs it and launches one up into the stands because he almost, you know, he had an itch or he's Randy Johnson and he kills a bird. <laughs> the ball, or, you know, like what baseball's full of as boring as baseball is at times. And it just, it just is to me. Um, there's a lot of chaotic moments in baseball where no matter how much statistics they have and the saber metrics book is amazing. Go ahead and read it. If you want the, the one that's actually written on it um, is great, but there's so many interactive elements in that ballpark in the predetermined confines of a baseball diamond, which you can't escape. The ball goes outside. doesn't count anymore. It's like it doesn't exist, but inside of it, so many different things can happen. Uh, the pitching stats and pitchers not following their, Predicted stats is usually a, a one that I would look at and talk about. Hitting, I don't waste time with hitting. Hitting's too too wild anyway. Is that it? Then I think Brandon, you definitely tell me if we're. If, if you guys uh, need to go further, I I got to be honest with you. I've got a bunch of other sessions going on here, and I was doing everything I could to listen in on this. <laughs> It was, uh, it, it looked fantastic and interesting and between chainsaws and sabermetrics, which I'm a total sabermetric dork, uh, <laughs> it's it was, uh, that was cool. And that you're was... living in the middle of chaos at the moment. You probably didn't need any more. <laughs> no, I, I, I wish this was the only session going on right now because this, this, uh, that he is really... a focal point, right? Yeah. Brand is the focal point. Uh, Brandon's sitting on what's actually known as the edge of chaos phenomenon. So the edge of chaos is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's right where you're at the point of totally losing your stability in a system because you've got so much information coming into you. Here's the really cool thing about the edge of chaos, however. Every study done in a hard science, chemistry especially, that shows any element being put at the edge of chaos, it either dies at that point because it can't handle it or it pushes it gets pushed through the edge of chaos goes through the catalytic conversion whatever comes out the other side if anything comes out the other side is better and stronger than what it was before so you're talking about zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance very i couldn't i couldn't fix a motorcycle to save my life i could saw it in half have at it but i couldn't fix it but yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, They've done. Thing. Yeah, I, I just meant the concepts in the book. That's what he was talking about there. He talks about the uh, the quality of stuckness, which yes. in your terms would be on the edge of chaos. So what I do in my research is I intentionally push people to that edge in their planning process so that whatever comes out the other side is a more resilient organization that should be able to um, self-organize better and be more resilient. So my studies are uh, dealing with resiliency building uh, in disaster management, because what's a better chaotic situation than a disaster? An I, disaster. I, I appreciate that. I can tell you in, in regard to the organizations that I run, I run more than just this organization. Um, I, I, one of the things I tell everybody is embrace the chaos. I absolutely embrace it. I love it. Um, I really think you come out stronger for it. If you don't, it's going to have its way with you. <laughs> <laughs> Another reference for you, which, which would fit for if you don't, it'll have your, your its way with you. 
is D Hawk's concept of chaotic. Have you encountered that? A long time ago, but you'd have to refresh my memory on it. I so much so much of that stuff I left back in my thesis for a while, and then I had to focus on the sports stuff to for well, my job. D Hawk set up the whole Visa organization. All, all our okay. Visa cards are on that right. process, and along the way, what he recognised is that he was simultaneously, but not in the same place managing chaos and order. So he coined the term chaos or chaos with the first three yep. letters of each. Yep. And I find that really helpful for sort of trying to explain to students that your things look orderly, like your chainsaw when it's not in use, but the minute you turn it on, it's going to be chaotic. Right. Or chaos. Absolutely. Uh, in, re in relation to the suggestions on resources, what I'm going to, uh, from Kathleen and for everybody, um, if you want to look at the literally anything done in the last 20 years, 30 years out of the Wharton School at Pitt, um, there is a uh, scholar over there by the name of Louise Comfort, and I'm sure I'm sure Elizabeth has seen has seen that before, and some others. No, uh, Louise K. Comfort. Okay, so Louise K. Comfort has been running a uh, risk management research center out of the Wharton School, which is a phenomenal school out of Pitt, uh, for I don't know how many decades now. She specifically looks at complex adaptive systems and how you get them to actually really work in the real world. And she has worked with the biggest, most significant organizations in America, and her work is phenomenal. And if you're looking for a resource to be able to uh, apply to students, give to students to get them to start talking. Her, her stuff is so, uh, so powerful and so well done, but so accessible. That's why I'm telling you about her. Thanks, it's, thanks. it's so accessible. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would read literally anything she has done in the last, geez, I don't know. I mean, she's that person, something happens and FEMA's shaking in their boots, they pick up the phone, they call her. It's like for real, like the White House calls her, like, what do we do? She, she's that kind of mind. Um, I applied for a postdoc and didn't get, get it with her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> I was never going to get it. I try. I didn't care. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Shane, Thank I got to go. This much. has been really great. Thank you. My head Thanks. is with all kinds of thoughts and ideas and uh, places that I want to go. So thank you very much. Take the slides, look at the resources, the websites. There's a lot of fun visuals for class. There's a lot of neat little things. You could, the one where you actually recreate your butterfly how you want by changing the, that's, that's just fun. It just gets some talking. It just gets some thinking. Um, go right ahead. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Shane.